How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. What a beautiful picture of redemption. You know, I can listen to that verse over and over. Welcome to Through the Bible. In just a moment, Dr. J. Vernon McGee is going to take us through this magnificent passage in Isaiah 52 as we read about God's redemption story as a whole and specifically of Jerusalem. So as you find your seat, let's bow our heads and begin this exciting adventure in God's Word with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the beauty and truth that we find in your Word. Thank you most of all for the salvation provided for us through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would speak to the hearts of those who are listening, especially those who have yet to receive the precious gift of salvation offered to them through Jesus' death on the cross. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now let's head out to Isaiah 52 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come today to this 52nd chapter of Isaiah And there are two things that we need to note as we enter this chapter. First of all, let me say that as we began to move through Isaiah, there came into not focus, but rather in a silhouette, in the shadows, in the background, there came the servant of Jehovah. That servant of Jehovah, as we move through Isaiah, it became clear that that servant was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we're approaching the 53rd chapter, it's very clear who the servant of Jehovah is and that it is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. For the 53rd chapter will make that very clear. Now, the second thing that we need to note as we enter the 52nd chapter is simply this. As we were in the 51st chapter, you will recall that I labeled it the alarm clock chapter of the Bible. And the alarm was going off, by the way. Verse 9, awake, awake, put on strength. In other words, wake up. In verse 17, wake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem. Well, we have the clock sounding an alarm again. And we have in this chapter, in verse 1, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Now, we have here in this chapter, in the first eight verses, invitation to the redeemed remnant of Israel. And then we have the institution of the kingdom to Israel, and then we have the introduction of the suffering servant in verses 13 and 15, and it's very clear who we're talking about there. Now back to verse 1 again, because the alarm is sounding, and God hasn't turned it off even today, and we need to listen. Awake, awake, put on strength, O Zion. Now I take it that when he says, O Zion, that he doesn't mean old Los Angeles or old Pocadilla, Idaho or old Muleshoe, Texas. I take it that he means Zion and that Zion is a geographical place in the land of Israel and that it's a very definite geographical location. It's really the high point in the city of Jerusalem. It was David's favorite spot. Now, the blessing is coming upon Jerusalem, and it will no longer be a place that's unattractive. I will give you my own private opinion of Jerusalem, and I was not thrilled when I saw the city the first time. I approached Jerusalem the first time I saw it. I came up from Jericho, actually, And we made that turn around the Mount of Olives by Bethany. And then you come in sight of the temple area, the wall there, and the east gate. And very frankly, that was a thrill. It was late in the afternoon, and it was a shadow over the city, actually. But I couldn't wait till the next morning to enter the city 
and to visit around. Well, the next day was a great disappointment to me. That city is not beautiful in my book. And yet it says beautiful for situation is Jerusalem. And the Word of God says that. And that's God's viewpoint. And I will agree with him that the situation of it is beautiful, but not the city. But he makes it clear here, it's going to be beautiful someday. And it will all rest upon the work of our Lord in redemption. You see, he'll redeem this physical universe. He'll redeem that city. And what we have here is the millennial kingdom has arrived. And all the creation is groaning and travailing together in pain. And it will become a very beautiful spot, the world will, when the kingdom arrives. And it's going to come because of the redemption in Christ. Because he not only redeemed us, and he not only redeemed our bodies for this creature down here. We're groaning and travailing today in these bodies. We're going to get a new body. And when that takes place, creation will be redeemed and the physical earth will be changed so that we have here a redemption, not only of the person, but of the property and the type of redemption God permitted in the Old Testament, which is an illustration of it. Now he says here, verse 2, shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. And today, the Arab is there, and these sacred spots are all covered with all kinds of churches, Russian, the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, and the Church of All Nations. They're all over the place. And that place needs to be released from religion. It needs to be turned loose from the sin and the low degree of civilization that's there right now. And that's coming someday. And it'll come during the millennium. And for 2,500 years, that city has been a captive city and trodden down of the Gentiles. And now the shackles of slavery are to be removed. Verse 3, for thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Now, since God received nothing from those who took his holy city captive, he's going to give them nothing in return. He's just going to take it from them and restore it again. What a picture you have here. And then he speaks of the fact in verse 4, for thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now, Jacob went down to Egypt by invitation, but his children were made slaves, and the Assyrians and others likewise have oppressed them. That's ended when the millennium begins. What a picture you have here. Verse 5, Now therefore what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them, make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Now God received no gain from the years of his people rejection. Therefore, he says, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. This, by the way, is such a lovely thought. When he was here 1,900 years ago, they did not know him. If they had only known the day of his visitation, well, they will know him when he comes again, and he'll say, Behold, it's I. And this has been rendered in a very free way by one commentator. He'll say, Here I am. Huh. Isn't that lovely? When he comes, Christ's rejecting world doesn't know him. And he'll say to that Christ's rejecting world, Here I am. Huh. Here I am. It won't be too late then for multitudes to turn to him that have rejected him. Now, we come in verse 9 to this second division. We have the institution of the kingdom here to Israel. Well, you notice here, break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. 
For the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. One of the things you will note about present-day Jerusalem, you do not find a joyful song anywhere. And that's true of the churches that are there. I listen. I never heard a joyful song. Uh, around the mosque of Omar? No. It's all a very, everything's in a minor key. And you go down to the wailing wall? Well, that's what it is. It's a wailing wall. And Israel is butting their heads against it today. But the way you're going to know when we get to the millennium is everybody's going to have fun. Break forth into joy. It's going to be joy. God doesn't care today, I think, for all of us saints walking around with long faces, complaining and criticizing. He wants us to have joy. That's his purpose. He said, that's one of the reasons. John says, I'm writing these things to you that your joy might be full. Not just have a little fun, but have fun all the time. How wonderful it is. This is the time when the answer to the prayer, thy kingdom come, is fulfilled, and you'll know it because there's going to be joy in this earth and the teardrop is gone and sorrow is gone and no longer will there be weeping on the earth, but it'll be a time of rejoicing. That's the kingdom. That's the institution of it. Now in verses 13 and 15, we have the introduction of the suffering servant. My friend, somebody has to travail if you're going to be able to rejoice at a birth, a new birth, and a new world. Therefore, we have here the suffering of the servant. Verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Several of the administrations that have been in Washington over the past few years if you will recall, have used this word prudent a great deal. They speak of being prudent in their conduct. Well, the very interesting thing is there's some question about whether they've been prudent or not. If you think the Democrats have been prudent, ask the Republicans. If you think the Republicans have been prudent, ask the Democrats. You find out nobody's been prudent. And all you got to do is ask some others, and they'll say nobody's been prudent. Well, I'd be very frank and say myself that man today does not deal prudently. When the Lord Jesus comes, he'll deal prudently. That's the picture that we have here. And he's the one that God hath highly exalted and given him a name above every name. Now we have in verse 14, though here is your suffering servant now. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. Now, this is the picture of the crucifixion of Christ. And this statement here prepares the way for chapter 53 that's coming up. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. Now, I want to be very careful here because it's not always a sign of orthodoxy to dwell upon the sufferings of Christ upon the cross. Actually, you can be very crude in the way that you preach the cross and deal with it. May I be very careful, therefore, in what I'm going to say now. After the three hours of darkness upon the cross, it was during those hours of darkness when man could no longer do anything. The night had come when no man could work, but the Son of God was working on the cross. It was during that time that though man could not work, God was. And it was during those three hours that that cross became an altar on which the Son of God, who is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And when light finally broke upon the cross at three in the afternoon, and men saw him, they were shocked. They were startled. He didn't even look human. He was just a bloody piece of quivering human flesh. 
It was unspeakable. We'll see the next chapter. There was no beauty that we should desire him. Now, that's the reason God put the mantle of darkness down upon the cross. Nothing there to satisfy the curiosity, the morbid curiosity of man. But remember, he was marred more than any man. And this is what I mean. When I was pastor in Nashville, Tennessee, I had a very wonderful elder of the church who was a captain in the fire department. A man given over, though, to first aid. He was almost hipped in that particular category. He had a first aid kit in his car. He taught it all the time. He always mentioned it. I know that he said to me a dozen times, do you carry a first aid kit? Well, I didn't then, but because of his urging, I finally got one and put in the car. Well, one early morning, he was going out on a call, a fire alarm. It was very early, and he crawled up on the hook and ladder, and he was riding there. And a milk truck crossed the pathway of this truck. The truck dodged, attempted to go around this milk truck, and when it veered by the hook and ladder truck, it turned upside down and the men on it were dragged along the asphalt. Well, I got a call just about five-something in the morning, and I was told he was in the hospital. And I rushed there. He was still alive. His father was sitting by the side of his bed. I looked at him, and actually his face was so marred, I didn't even recognize him. All I could see was a mouth. And he was breathing. That was all. He didn't last very long. In an hour's time, he was gone. He died. May I say to you, many times since then, I've thought of the fact that the Lord Jesus was marred more than any man, and that means he had to be marred more than that captain in the fire company there in Nashville. And friends, I didn't even recognize him just a piece of quivering human flesh. That's what my Lord went through on the cross. And I don't know that we ought to move over in the realm of being crude in describing that, because the next verse says, So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now, that expression, so shall he sprinkle many nations, that could be translated, so shall he make with astonishment many nations. Now, this carries out the thought that his death will startle when it's properly understood. The death of Christ should never become commonplace to anyone. And I think that we ought to be very careful, those of us who preach and teach, that we just don't get in the habit of keep talking about the cross of Christ and the blood of Christ and make it commonplace. It should startle men to tell about him because his death was different. And let us keep it that way. We have not told it properly until it startles people, by the way. And I wonder now, this is the preparation for Isaiah 53. And I'd like to ask you a very personal question. Are you prepared now to consider the profound mystery of Isaiah 53? And that chapter opens in this very marvelous way. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, in chapter 53 of Isaiah, I've divided it like this. The first nine verses, the suffering of the Savior, and verses 10 through 12, the satisfaction of the Savior. And I have a message on this, and that message I'll bring next time, but the title of it is A Photograph of the Cross. But let's look here at this wonderful 
picture that we have of the cross in Isaiah 53. Now, those that are acquainted with God's word, they realize that the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and the 22nd Psalm give us a more vivid account of the crucifixion of Christ than is found anywhere else in the Bible. Now, this may shock some of you because we're accustomed to think that the four Gospels alone describe the sad episode of the horrible death of the Son of God. Now, if you'll examine carefully the gospel accounts, you will make the discovery that only a few unrelated events that are connected with the crucifixion are given and that the actual crucifixion is passed over with a reverent restraint. The Holy Spirit has drawn the veil of silence over that cross and none of the lurid details are set forth for the curious mob to gaze and leer upon. It is said of the brutal crowd who murdered him that they sat down and watched him. You and I are not permitted to join that crowd. Even they did not see all, for God placed over his son's agony mantle of the darkness. And some sensational speakers, they gather to themselves a bit of notoriety by painting with picturesque speech the minutest details of what they think took place at the crucifixion of Christ. Art has given us the account of his death in ghastly reality. You and I will probably never know, even in eternity, the extent of his suffering. None of the ransom ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep. That was lost. Well, we're going to have to leave off there today. But next time, here in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, we're going to see the substitutionary death of Christ upon the cross for sinners. May God richly bless you now, my beloved. As Dr. McGee read, Isaiah 53, 1 says, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? What do you think? Is the cross just a symbol? Or do you believe that in his death on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ conquered death, taking our place and then providing the ultimate gift of eternal life for us? If you're ready to receive his gift of salvation, you can visit ttb.org and search for How Can I Know God? There you'll find several free, downloadable resources, including the Inside Story. It arranges scripture verses in sequence, giving you a terrific overview of the salvation story for yourself. Again, that's ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. And remember, you can also write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And when you contact us, we'd love to hear how your life is impacted by our study of God's Word. For example, notes like this from Bud in Whittier, California are such an encouragement to keep going in God's Word. Bud writes, I got off the Bible bus for a short time and realized what an anchor you had been in my spiritual life. When I came to see how that affected my whole life, I got back on for good. I had no idea the effect it would have in developing a new creation out of me. From the radio to my ears and straight to my heart. There's not one thing about your program I don't love completely. The letters, the world prayer team, the app, the hosts. I pray you'll continue to be fruitful stewards of our Lord and His Word. Well, thanks, Bud. Thanks for your note. And I'll be sure to save you a seat on the Bible bus. And I, I certainly hope that this letter inspires those of you who are new to keep traveling with us. Now, in our next study, Dr. McGee's message is a bit longer than usual, so here are a couple things that might be helpful for you to know. The first is a booklet that we have based on tomorrow's passage of Isaiah 53. It's called The Radical Cost of the Cross, What Jesus Really Paid for Your Salvation. Another great booklet based on Isaiah 6 is called What to Do When You Want God's Will. 
To download your free copies, just go over to ttb.org forward slash booklets. Also, I'd love to have you join me this weekend for the Sunday Sermon. Dr. McGee's message, When God Flexes His Muscles, is based on Isaiah chapter 53. You can listen on our app, online, or see if your local radio station carries the Sunday Sermon. You can always contact us directly at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Next time, the Bible bus takes us straight through the greatest chapter in the book of Isaiah, and possibly the whole Bible. You're not going to want to miss it. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll see you then. Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?